How y'all doing this morning? Thanksgiving week. <coughs> Let's see what we got here today. Sunday school, it's listed as 1115, it'll probably be more like 1125 or something like that. Uh, choir rehearsal today after Sunday school. You tap on project, if you got some uh, extra bills, coins, whatever, drop them in the basket back there. We got a few bucks last week. Um, over the course of the year, we really need 360. So, you'd be surprised how far a few bucks if everybody put, if we had a service every day of the year and we only got one dollar a service, we'd have five extra dollars to play with. So anyways, that's that. <laughs> Election of church officers today, that's going to be about five, seven minutes after service. We'll meet here in the front of the church. Official church members, gather here. We're not going to fool around. Short and sweet, get it over with. <clears throat> Helping hand, if you know somebody who really needs a... Uh, needs the gift of really groceries for Thanksgiving, uh, let me or Joyce know today. Okay, I've been able to take care of a couple, but if there's somebody else, let us know. Uh, again, we have our prayer list from last week. Totter, diverticulitis, Mary Margaret Sweeter, internal bleeding, a spot on her cheek. Helen's cousin has cancer and her nephew needs an endoscopy. Endoscopy. John Brogman's the pastor of the church down in uh, Mountaintop. And he had COVID, has COVID probably still. <coughs> but he's hoping he'll test negative. He'll test negative, which would be positive in my book. <laughs> uh, and he could be back in the saddle maybe Wednesday. So, anyways, that's the Mountaintop Church. It's just down below Wilkesburg. Uh, let's see, Howard Young has heart issues and other complications. He certainly is uh, very weak and needs our prayers. Um, Craig Vale recovered from back surgery. And the rest of our prayer list here. West Contra Hocken Church, that's the blue, they call it Blue Stone now, Church of the Week. Bill Harlock is a Senior of the Week. Wilson Romero of Columbia, Missionary of the Week children and our pillars of civilization. Anybody else ought to be on the prayer list here this morning? Let's start with Helen. Everybody put my prayers for my nephew Billy. He's had colonoscopy and everything's fine so you can take him off the Oh, good. And you could take uh, Marlene Price off the list. Good. She's doing well. <coughs> Rick. Uh, my great nephew, he was uh, diagnosed, diagnosed with uh, the COVID. Uh, he is in the CMC hospital. Uh, he has pneumonia <coughs> on top of it, and he has Down syndrome, so he does have heart problems. Everybody ready for Thanksgiving? Got your turkeys? When you're, when Brandon was in grade school, you know, they had show and tell. And uh, <laughs> one Thanksgiving, we prepared the turkey down here. In fact, I prepared the turkey, right? We're going to bring it up to the festival. We're going to bring all the food. Hey, Mom and Dad, don't worry about anything. We'll bring everything up there. Well, we got up there, and uh, I was very sure that Beth was supposed to get the turkey out of the refrigerator. <laughs> oh, no. She was very sure that I was supposed to get the turkey out of the refrigerator. The turkey was replaced by a block of cracker barrel cheese. <laughs> and then it's show and tell. This is McCarthy. Remember Mrs. McCarthy? <laughs> Just wonderful lady. She was so great. I think she taught the kindergarten over there, or for kindergarten, right? Yeah. 42 years. 
And uh, so she says, oh, the funniest thing happened. She says, Brandon, raise his hand for show and tell. Yes, Brandon, what is? He says, well, we went up to my grandparents for Thanksgiving, but Daddy forgot the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm forever hung with uh, that. Anybody else? In other words, your goose was cooked. <laughs> yes, and I still am very bitter about the whole thing. Because I have a different viewpoint of what really happened. But it's all through the community now. Okay, great you're all here today. Let us, I think I, yes. Let's start with hymn number 111. Beth's going to sing for us in a few minutes. Great to have you all here today. Let's set sail into Thanksgiving week. 111. Time to scatter stones in the time of the 
a time to embrace, and a time to pray for any person. There's a time to search, and a time to give up. A time to keep, and a time to go away. Time to tear, and a time to mend. A time to be silent, and a time to speak. Time to love, and there's a time to hate. A time to be more poor, and a time to be more you may be seated. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Let's bow our heads, we'll have a word for it. Father, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. And Lord, for the privilege of gathering together here, again together, and worshiping you and honoring you and thanking you. Lord, you always do what is good, and you always do what is right. But down here, we get things very mixed up and twisted around. <coughs> And sin and selfishness, we hurt each other, we have brought sickness, suffering, pain and death into the world, broken relationships, broken families, pain of every variety. It's all our fault as a race. And our Heavenly Father, that you should <clears throat> continue to love us is magnificent. That you should not withhold your only begotten Son, that he might suffer on our behalf. We should be filled with gratitude. We should be filled with thankfulness. We should honor you and worship you and emulate you for the rest of our days. Father, would you fill us with the Spirit of Christ <coughs> that we might become light and salt in this world that needs it so desperately, that we might bring stability, that we might be agents of goodness, agents of peace, that we might shed bitterness, vindictiveness, and all these other things that just darken an already dark world. Set us free in Christ, and we'll be grateful forever. Our Heavenly Father, there are friends and family of ours who are heading into this Thanksgiving season who have been hurt deeply and suffered great loss over the past year. Loved ones have passed away. Different things have happened. Create breaks. Physical sicknesses have come upon folk we pray that you call their hearts close to you you are meek you are lowly you are gentle you are humble you will in no wise cast us out please pour out your comforting spirit upon the hearts and souls of those who need most to take their eyes off this world for a little while our troubles are Frustrations, they'll be there tomorrow. But today, and maybe especially Thursday, let us set them aside and pay attention to you and be grateful for what we do have. Our Heavenly Father, we have names on our prayer list here this morning and names that have been added. And there are additional friends and family that uh, will never be published here. But each and every one of these folk need help. And our Heavenly Father, we ask you to bring physical healing to those who that would be the best thing for them. Lord, down here, we always just think, you know, please heal our friends and family. And when you don't, we are confused and disappointed and challenged. But you know what you're doing. And we really don't. You have revealed yourself to us as merciful and gracious and loving and just but you still remain a mystery in many, many ways. We need to trust you and know that the God of heaven and earth is always doing the best thing. So Father, speak to us about allowing your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. 
and trusting that you are doing best. Please heal those who it would be best to heal. We pray for strength, courage, perseverance for those who go through difficult and dark hours. We pray, Father, for our friends down at the uh, Conshohocken Church with a new pastor down there, a place of enthusiasm, a place of uh, optimism. Uh, that's a community that's very different from ours. And they got a black pastor down there, and we're grateful that you have brought him to us. And we pray that he might share the good news that in Christ Jesus there is life eternal to whosoever will. And we thank you, Father, uh, for bringing these people to us. We also think of our buddy Bill Harlock, and we ask you to watch over him. We pray that you'd fill his days with peace and patience, and again, draw him close to you. Lord, you have made it so that there is longing in our hearts. And I'm sure Bill feels that longing now and then for Gladys. She's gone. And that is a part of the hope that will be opened on Resurrection Day. Father, we put your put our friend Bill in your hands. We pray for the Romeros and their work down there in Columbia. We pray for men, women, and children come to know the Lord. We thank you for that great work down there. We pray for the young people of our society. Our Heavenly Father, when we were young, the adults looked at us and thought uh, this country doesn't have much going for it. And uh, now we sort of feel the same way. Uh, but these things are in your hands. Make us to know that and understand that. We need to trust you. You know what you're doing. And Father, we're just, we need to put our hands in yours. Change the things we can change. Be the people we can be. But leave the whole picture to you. It's your world. We pray today for the pillars of civilization, for law enforcement agents, healthcare workers, military, government. So many of these folk, Lord, are gonna spend uh, their holidays far away from home. And that's a sacrifice not only for them, but for their families back here. And we know that many of them, too many, will have an empty chair on Thanksgiving because somebody went to work to defend the innocent and paid the ultimate price. Or somebody answered the call and showed up <coughs> and gave their life for those that they didn't even know. Bless these families and bless these situations in Jesus' name. Father, we can pray all day. We're going to leave our prayers to these. We ask you to hear and answer all our prayers as we open our hearts before you and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, our power, and glory, glory forever. Amen. And now we have special music from Beth Rupert.
house right beyond Tompkinsville Church in case you didn't know. Anyways, 
there's some rock in there, not much. There's a lot of uh, grass, green grass. And some of it's kind of long and there's a lot of trees. And you go through there in the hot summer and down at the bottom of that hill, there's a creek that runs through. And a lot of times you'll see cattle just grazing around, walking around there. And David knew all about tending those sheep in this case. And it's so interesting because like again, he, just a boy, didn't know what life was gonna bring him. Uh, he was just going through his daily activities. That's what God had given him to do. Found some time to practice with that sling. Having no idea in the history of the world that he would make the greatest shot anybody ever made with a sling that he was just using to chase away animals and with a sling that he would use to practice to oh, knock a rock off a post over there, knock this little stone off that rock I put over there. Just doing it out in the woods or doing it out in the fields, out in the pastures. No idea where it was going to lead to. That Just imagine thousands for the rest of history People would talk about that little boy in a sling. And to him, he's just out in the field watching sheep. And David one day becomes king. And I don't know if David learned to read and write. He might have been a poet, the kind of poet that uh, the poetry just flows forth from him. And he had a staff of writers maybe. This is kind of what I think have happened. David more a warrior type. I don't think he ever really took time to study writing and reading. But I think he had a, people in his staff who could do that. And he'd tell him these things that come through his mind, the things God revealed to him. And even then, I wonder if David had any idea that the things he was saying in that far away, relatively small, backwater kingdom, would one day become the words of God. And the people all over the world would say, this is probably the greatest poem that was ever written. You have no idea what's going on in your life right now. We think we're just going through every day and every day tomorrow's gonna be like yesterday. Yesterday was just like what the day after tomorrow is gonna be. And it all blends in and it's all the same and it gets so boring and so monotonous and these weeks just fly by and Meanwhile, you have no idea what God in heaven is doing with what you're doing. And the influence you have on the people around you, we don't have a clue. God has put eternity in our hearts. And yet he remains a magnificent mystery that we could never figure out. And we can't figure God's doings why he does what he does, why he doesn't do what we wish he would do. And then sometimes we realize he was doing things that if we ever conceived them, we would have begged him to do these things and be so thankful. David in his, who knows, maybe when he said this poem, he was sitting under a shady tree somewhere in his kingdom. And he said, the Lord, he's my shepherd. I know all about being a shepherd. The Lord, he's my shepherd. That's a theme that runs through the Bible, the idea of the shepherd aspect of God. In fact, in Psalm 100 and 100, listen to this. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. You know, that's the antidote to sour disappointment. It's to look to God and just start praising him in the middle of the disappointment, in the middle of the frustration. It'll change the way you see things. It'll change the way you see the world. It'll bring hope <coughs> manifesting itself in. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We're his people 
We're the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth for all generations. The Lord is good. Everything he does is good. The things that we see as evil in Christ turn into good. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and we will. It's a part of life in this world. It doesn't matter how it comes to you or when it comes to you, but it will come. Whether it's in personal relationships, whether it's the breakdown of the body, whether it's frustration over things that you just can't control. And you have to know in the bottom of your heart that God is good even when it hurts, even when it's dark, even when it's disappointing, even when it's frustrating. That's the only way to get through life. You got choice. We can wallow in self-pity. We can do that. And it's hard not to do sometimes. But we can make a deliberate choice to say, yes, it hurts. Yes, it's frustrating. Yes, it's disappointing. Yes, it hurts me to the core. But God, I know you. And I know what you're like. And I know you'll turn this out to good. Would you fill my heart with hope? Would you give me peace in the middle of this hell that I'm walking through? You'll walk through it. Jesus walked through it himself. Isaiah wrote, and he said this about our shepherd God. O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with thy strength. Lift it up and be not afraid. You know who's saying those words? O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountains, O Jerusalem. This is the same Jerusalem that the same Isaiah has envisioned falling before the Babylonian hordes. This is the same man that knows the Zion, the Jerusalem that he loves, is falling down before his very eyes. And God is raising a razor to the north. And this man's been called to tell these people, God has summoned a razor from the north to cut you down and to take you away. I've called you. I've pleaded with you. i begged you. I've sent prophets. And you haven't listened to them. And now all that's left is disappointment and discipline. And you're going to lose your country. He told Jerusalem. And Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord will come with strong hand. His arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him. And all his work is before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. And he'll gather the lambs with his arm. That's where that stained glass window right there comes from. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. And he'll gather the lambs with his arm. And carry them in his bosom. And shall gently lead those that are with young. He will take up his people in the middle of the ultimate frustration. In the middle of the ultimate disappointment. In the middle of the ultimate hurt. If you let the shepherd come and lift you up and comfort you, he'll never fail you. He'll never disappoint you. People will always fail you. People will disappoint you. People that are closest to you 
are capable of hurting you like nobody else <coughs> on the planet Earth. And they will. Sometimes because they're hurt. I've been watching this guy. Uh, he calls himself the Hoof GP. He's over there in Ireland. And he's uh, an Irish guy. And he travels around to the various farms in Ireland. And he's got this big rig that he pulls up in. And it's uh, got all kind of hydraulics on it. And these big bulls, these big cows, they, they walk into this stall. And the thing comes around them. And it lifts them up off the ground. And then he puts this thing on there, and their hoof goes up like this. And he examines their hooves, and he cleans them, he trims them. It's really fascinating. He uses, you know how uh, you got a, like a power grinder, like a DeWalt grinder? That's what he uses on those things. It's amazing. You watch, it, and it doesn't hurt them. It's just like trimming your fingernails, and we use a steel nail clip. Well, anyways, some of those cows come in there, or bulls that come in there, <coughs> I mean, they weigh a ton. And they're walking around on infected feet. And you know where those cows walk every day. And they're walking in cow manure. And it's liquid. And it's terrible. <laughs> but that's their life. And they walk around and he'll put up that hoof sometimes and you'll literally see the maggots crawling inside the cavity in the hoof. You'll start to peel that hoof away. And he takes a block and he, you know, the hoof has like two parts to it. And you put a block on this side that's healthy to get this side off the ground. And so he'll trim away at this one, take all the cutaneous material, the fingernail, the hoof, out from around where that infection is, and he'll sometimes spray it with what he calls which we would call iodine, because we're not Irish. I have a kind of an Irish accent, don't you think? <laughs> Eadine. I'm going to keep that one, just for fun. Anyways, you spray it with maybe iodine or something, and then he's got like a white powder that he'll put on that, and then he wraps that damaged hoof up with that stretch wrap, just like they use in football. Uh, before they tape your leg, they'll wrap you with this uh, kind of a gauzy thing, and then they'll... It, tape over it with the actual tape and then they lower that big thing down and that one ton animal all of a sudden finds out he can walk on that hoof. It's suspended by that block but that tremendous pain is gone. We have people in our life who are very unfriendly and not easy to work with or very disappointing and very frustrating and they hurt us deeply and a lot of times it's because their hoof is killing them and they may or may not even realize it but when you're got a problem when you've got an issue whether it's physical or whether it's emotional you don't act like an adjusted normal person does it hurts the way you behave. And you know what you do? Anybody who's been around old folk who are on their way out and they've watched their life be reduced to a chair and an occasional trip to the bathroom, sometimes needing help. And you know who they're meanest to? The person who's closest to them. The person who makes the biggest contribution, the person who makes the biggest sacrifice to try and help that person is the person who gets hurt the most. Because that person who's been reduced to sitting in that chair, they've got nobody else. And they've got nowhere else. And they know, they didn't even know it, they don't like calculate this, they don't figure it out. It just becomes natural and they pour out that infection, they pour out that poison that's inside them, they pour it out on the person that they love the most, and it hurts them the most because when you're on the outside getting the poison poured out on you, when you're taking that, your mind is telling you a lot of different things, and it's very hard to be merciful and gracious. 
it's really easy to get frustrated and say, the heck with it all, and walk away. Jesus said this. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus literally gave his life for us, his sheep. Who are you giving your life for? In the spirit of Christ, who do you give your life for? You end up giving your life for what? Your children, don't you? You give your life for your parents. You should. You give your life for your husband. You give your life for your wife. You give up so much. Because that's what good shepherds do. And that's what the Spirit of Christ causes us to do. Makes it feel like it's got to be done. If it's not me, then who? I'll do it. I'll take it. And we just walk into it. That's the Spirit of Christ. That's the Spirit of the Son of God. The sons of God. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He that's a hireling, not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not. He sees the wolf coming, and he leaveth the sheep. He abandons the ship. Because his hide is more important than the one he ought to be loving. And they take off, and they disappear, and they abandon ship, and they leave you holding the bag. It says here, the hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and he leaveth the sheep, and he fleeth, and the wolf catches them, and scatters the sheep, and the hireling fleeth, because he's a hireling. And he really doesn't care for the sheep. Do you realize that there's this conflict in Christianity where we know that we're the children of God. We've been born again, the Spirit comes upon us, and we have assurance in our heart that we're the children of God. We trust God in His Word, and we take Him in His Word, and we're saved by grace, and by grace alone. That not of yourselves, that no one should boast. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. You're saved by the grace of Christ. But by the same token, your behavior will reveal the depth of that relationship with Christ. And those that abandon ship reveal that they might not have the germ. They might not have the virus. They might not have the spirit because they're not acting like their savior. They don't act like they're Christ. We're on the outside looking in. We're not in a good position to judge why this person behaves this way, why that person behaves that way. And we see people do things that are frankly very unchristian. And yet the testimony of Christianity is there. And we look at the situation and we make our judgment. Thank the eternal God that those that are looking at you aren't your judge. That those that look at you, because I'll tell you what, I bet every one of us has somebody in our life who looks at us and says, you know what? They talk the game, but they sure don't act it. I'll guarantee you, you've got somebody like that in your life. You probably know who it is, or who they may be. They're not your judge. And you're not the judge of those who you look upon and make the same judgment. No, the good shepherd, he loves his sheep. He forgets about who he is and isn't judging him. He forgets about the cross that lies ahead. And he embraces his sheep. But the hireling, he flees. And he will be exposed in God's good time. Jesus said in verse 14 of John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. He says it again. Boy, I love Dr. Stewart again back there in uh, United Wesleyan College down in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Dr. Stewart, with all his Ivy League training, higher education, told us when you keep reading the same thing over in a few short verses, it means 
That person wants you to think about what he's writing. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd again, he says. And I know my sheep. And am known of mine. My sheep, I know, and they know me. We know Christ. He says, as the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. Well, that's a pretty good, easy one to un untangle. Jesus knows his Father, and God the Father knows Jesus. That's a pretty easy, pretty direct relationship to pick up. He says, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. We're just talking about this. How in the world can good people, intelligent people, educated people, see the world so differently? We just saw this Rittenhouse thing, if you followed it, or even if you mildly considered it. And not only do you have people who look at the thing and see the exact different thing, but you have entire networks of TV that are staffed with people who see the exact same event in a completely different way. And each side, they have all this support for what they know is the truth and what they've seen. And it's inconceivable that with all the evidence laid out, how could anybody think differently than what I'm looking at? And yet you've got parents or children or brothers or sisters or friends or neighbors who see it exactly different from you. Jesus has other sheep that come from another fold. For these people, it was Jewish people, and Jesus was saying, you know what, there's a Gentile world out there, and I came to save them as sure as I came to save you. And those people born and raised in those synagogues said, that just can't be. Those people, their theology's all wrong. They worship the wrong gods. They don't know what they're doing. They haven't been revelate, revealed. They're not the chosen people. And yet Jesus said, you know what? I died for them as sure as I did for you. And in fact, when he was a young boy in his own synagogue, he stood up to read and he said, in effect, my Jewish brethren, God loves the Syrians. You gotta be kidding. Those people that have persecuted us and brought war to bear upon us and that have destroyed us, yeah, he loves them just like he loves you. And you know what the people said? Thank you for enlightening us. We accept your great wisdom. No, they wanted to throw him over a cliff. They wanted to kill him. It was the same as it is now. You know what the good news is? I know how right I am. And I am. I've seen the evidence. I've seen the videos. I know what I know. But what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? I'm putting my faith in this good shepherd who hangs from a cross and says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's the good news of the gospel. That's why we have thanksgiving. I must, they're not of this fold. Them also I must bring. Not I feel like bringing a good, I must bring them. And they're going to hear my voice. And there should be one fold and one shepherd. But when we get into the kingdom of God, and we've stripped away all the confusion of this world, you're going to look into the face of people you never dreamt were there, would be there, and you're going to thank the living God that they're there. You're going to say, Lord, I didn't want them around. I didn't want them to be here. I knew they need punishment. I knew they need judgment. I knew how wicked and evil they were. But you're going to look in their face and you're going to think, oh my God, he loved them like he loves me. How merciful 
our Savior is. One fold and one shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. In other words, I lack nothing. Every single thing needed is yours in Christ. He makes me to lie down, not in dried out, <coughs> crusty ground, but in green pastures, besides still waters. What a picture. I love that thing up there in uh, Route 207. Jack, uh, Jack, and, uh, Jack and Jack live up in God's country, really. Still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why not? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. That word, if you were looking at it in Greek, or if you were looking at it in Latin, you would see, thou christenest me. Thou pours your oil of comfort over my head, just like David had the oil of christening poured over his head, establishing him as the king. My cup runneth over. I don't lack. I'm not thirsty. I've got more than I need. And all the days of my life, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because I'll never sin again. I'll never fail God again. I'll never have a bad attitude. I'll never do anything wrong. No. Because the Lord is our Savior. And He is merciful. And He is gracious. And He is just. And He who would hang from a cross on your behalf, He can be trusted. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your holy words. Because we live down in a world that sometimes feels very far away from you. And we watch things happen before our eyes, sometimes on TV, but all too often in living color, face to face. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death and see things that are hurtful and painful and would knock us out of the box. Our Heavenly Father, our only hope, is the good shepherd, the gentle shepherd, the one who in the midst of the carnage takes us up in his arm and comforts us. Our Heavenly Father, prayer right now is that you would put your comforting arms around those who need it most. Here in this house, right here and now, and on through this week, this month, here and don't leave us or forsake us but make your presence known. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, would you please turn with me to um, number 54. And I will go on the porch for a couple minutes and then say goodbye to a couple people and then I will come back here in five to seven minutes and we'll meet right here in front and we will elect Helen Mashama as the head officer of the church. <laughs> Standing as we sing.
have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, again, as we head, in, head into Thanksgiving, uh, for many it's going to be a time of uh, wonderful celebration and family togetherness. For many it's going to be a reminder of separation and disappointment. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that your comforting spirit that might come upon those who need it most and that you would carry them away into your loving arms and make them to know in your heart, in their hearts, that you were at work, that you are bringing to bear the very force <coughs> of heaven itself to bring peace and hope and joy and happiness and help us to trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.